Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, Congressman Brian Bilbray says it's over, conceding the hotly contested race in San Diego's 52nd Congressional District. And San Diego's City Council President is stepping down. We'll tell you what's next for Tony Young. And I'm Peggy Pico. Just ahead on our weekly roundtable, we'll explain why the world-renowned Salk Institute is undertaking its first ever fundraising campaign. Then, some say La Jolla Cove has gone to the birds. We'll find out what's being done about this stench hovering over the protected beach. A San Diego research ship returns home after a six-year voyage around the world. And San Diego's rescue mission prepares for a huge Thanksgiving meal with more than 2,000 guests expected. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Republican Brian Bilbray conceded defeat today in the 52nd Congressional District race. Democrat Scott Peters wins the seat by about 5,100 votes. In a written statement, Bilbray says he called Peters to congratulate him and he calls for unity, saying, quote, While Scott and I differed sharply on how to handle the issues facing our nation, now is the time to put those differences aside and find common ground to address our country's many challenges, end quote. Bill Bray says he'll keep fighting for issues he believes in. San Diego City Council President Tony Young has made it official. He's stepping down to take over as CEO for the San Diego chapter of the Red Cross. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr has been following this story and joins us from the News Center. Katie, what did Young have to say about leaving his council position early to work at the Red Cross? Well, he stressed that he would still be serving the people of San Diego through his position as CEO of the local Red Cross. He says he wants to increase the organization's community presence and local impact. And he says his job will allow him to continue, continue serving his community, even though he won't be in office anymore. I've been down uh, at City Hall working on behalf of the residents of, Fort, of the 4th District and the city of San Diego for 10 years. And before that, I have worked uh, right on Skyline Drive at O'Farrell Middle School. So it's been 20 years that I've been providing services uh, for my community and for the, for the city of San Diego, and I don't intend to stop that. I should note he will be getting a large pay increase with his new job. Council members make $75,000 a year. Young's base pay will be $190,000 a year at his new job. And what does this mean for the city council? Well, Young will serve out the rest of the year. He starts at the Red Cross on January 2nd. The city will have to hold a special election to replace him. Now, the city charter dictates it has to be held within 90 days of Young tendering his resignation. And this really opens up the race for city council president. The council president is elected each year by the other members of the council, and he's in charge of setting the council agenda. Young has held that powerful role for the past two years. And now that Young is out, it increases the chances another council member it will be elected. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr. San Diego's unemployment rate went up slightly last month. The increase was one tenth of a point above the September number, but the unemployment rate is still down more than a point from this time last year. San Diego Rescue Mission started as a soup kitchen for homeless people 55 years ago. It's now one of the largest Christian missions in Southern California, offering shelter, recovery programs, and half a million meals a year. And Thanksgiving is one of the biggest. It's not just a meal. It's love all the way around, from God all the way through. Brian Kehoe supervises the kitchen at the San Diego Rescue Mission after going through the rehabilitation program four years ago. About 25% of the staff are former clients, and this is the only shelter in town that takes in women and children at night. Most are victims of domestic violence. 38-year-old Oscar Torres grew up in San Diego and was a meth addict whose family didn't want anything to do with him. He says coming to the rescue mission changed his life. And I accepted Christ here, you know. Uh, I, I was born in the church, but I ran from it, and you know, and had a lot of times with me. I, I, uh, I blame God for 
what I was going through. And uh, he kicked me into reality and let me know that it was my, my, my choices that got me there, not him. Torres spent 22 months in the men's rehab program. He's reunited with his family and now works at the mission to help other men transition and get back on their feet. It's a big, big thing for, for felons and, and people that haven't worked in a long time. They need all that extra help to get out there. Although the economy is slowly improving, it's not reflected in San Diego's growing homeless population. The mission's president, Herb Johnson, says people affected by Superstorm Sandy are seeking refuge. Uh, this place is getting flooded with people who lived on the East Coast, who are living marginally. Now there's no jobs, the economy is flat, and they're coming to San Diego in droves. And that's expected to add to the number of people seeking a friendly face and hot Thanksgiving meal on Saturday. Many other residents ate lunch outdoors as the chapel was being prepared for the big meal, with more than 2,000 people expected. Johnson says the rescue mission is funded entirely by public donations, and the recent elections and damage from Sandy have had an impact. About 60% of our income comes in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So this is a very important time of the year for us in terms of fundraising. San Diego Rescue Mission currently has a two-month waiting list for all of its long-term programs, but offers three meals a day to the needy at this center and three other locations. And the Thanksgiving meal will be served from 2 to 5 tomorrow afternoon. San Diego Rescue Mission is located on Elm Street downtown. The Salk Institute in La Jolla is in the midst of its first major fundraising campaign. Peggy Pico finds out what's behind its $300 million request. For the first time in its 53-year history, the Salk Institute is asking the public for financial help to fund its many research projects. Joining me with details about the research facility's fiscal struggle is UT San Diego science and technology reporter Gary Robbins. Gary, thanks for talking with us today. Salk Institute is a nonprofit research institute. It was uh, founded in 1960 by Jonas Salk, uh, the man who developed uh, the polio vaccine. What kind of research are they doing now? They do basic life science research. So they're trying to figure out things like the basic nature of the cell, how a cell changes and uh, leads to disease, what can be done about that. So it's, it's basic physiology, basic medicine, basically just looking at the nature of life. What's Salk's financial institution right? Uh, what's her financial situation right now? Well, I talked to uh, Erwin Jacobs, who's the um, chair of the board. He says they are in the black. They have a budget of about a hundred uh, million dollars a year. They are concerned that cuts in the budget that may be coming could reduce their budget by about ten million dollars. And let's talk about they got. They used to have two thirds of their funding came from the National Institutes of Health or the NIH, um, but that's really not the case uh, right now. How come? Well, the NIH has grown some. Uh, but it hasn't grown as much as a lot of people would like. And there are more people applying for, for, for grants. You know, so the life sciences has grown in the United States. And you can see it across the street. UC San Diego was open at approximately the same time as the Salk Institute. They were founded roughly at the same time. Now UC San Diego ranks among the top ten in funding in the U.S. And much of their funding comes from the NIH. So they have to compete with uh, places like uh, UCSD. And there's a lot here in San Diego. We have a cluster uh, of well-respected and well-known uh, institutions that do research. Does that competition really, um, are they kind of siphoning off or is it diversifying that funding? How, how does that affect their funding? Well, it, cre it creates more pressure on them. Uh, there are simply a lot more people seeking the same kind of grants that they want. Now, they do basic research. Um, they don't do a lot of applied research. In other words, they don't take the basic research and try to turn it into a treatment or a drug. Other people do that. So their focus is more limited. And that, you know, that can expose you to a lot more pressure because you really are doing one thing instead of more things. Well, it's certainly applied. You're talking about uh, applied research. That's where you do research for a specific drug or a exactly. specific treatment, trying to, trying to find something very specific. But their research over at Salk is really, really important for other scientists. You can't right. develop a drug if you uh, don't have the basic research behind it. So t tell us about some of that. Like their, um, I know they were really instrumental in Gleevec, a cancer drug. They have a scientist there named Tony Hunter who has been involved in the development of 200 drugs, including Gleevec. So they're doing the basic chemistry and the basic biology. They're looking at uh, molecules and proteins and how they work. 
other scientists who do applied research or pharmaceutical companies take that and try to find a way to turn it into a drug or a treatment. And they've been particularly successful in doing that with cancer treatments, including Gleevec. Hunter is one of 35 principal um, uh, scientists over there. There are others. Fred Gage is another whose work has, has led to dir directly to treatment. So they're doing the basics and they're letting everybody else develop from there. And that must put some pressure on them financially because it, it's harder to fund that type of research, correct? Well, the pre uh, it is harder to, to fund that be because in the past they've lived off the NIH, which has been fine. But over time, the NIH button, bu budget flattened out at a time when more people were seeking money. So that created a, you know, pressure. And they realized that they had to go to the public se sector through donors and say, help us make up the difference because we're doing basic research. And a lot of people want to fund uh, applied research. How, um, how are they doing right now? How much have they raised so far? They've raised $140 million of the $300 million they're going for. So they have a quiet phase where they really line up a lot of gifts and try to build momentum. Big donors. Yes, big donors. And so now what they're doing is um, they're going to take between now and then in 2015 to try to raise the other $160 million. Now they like, likely can do that. But I asked um, uh, Bill Brody, the head of the SOG, do you have to reintroduce yourself to the community? Because there's been so much growth there with um, the California Regenerative Center, sure. with UCSD growing, that it can be easy to get lost in the crowd up in the Mesa. Mm -hmm. Even yeah, they're doing great work. A whole bunch of stem cell regenerative, oh, yes. all sorts of research going on up there. Um, yeah, and their their news coverage doesn't get as much, or their press coverage, because they are working at that cell, cellular level. You right. don't get the headline of, "Gee, a new cancer drug is being tested," or, or something exactly. like that. Who's behind their uh, campaign fundraising? Erwin uh, Jacobs. Uh, and I had a long talk with him about what they were trying to do. He wants to make sure that that institution stays in the black. There was a situation a few years ago where Cold Spring Harbor back in New York, you know, they experienced financial problems because they weren't getting enough private donations. Jacobs wants to make sure that they don't get to that point. Um, so they're solid now, but they're trying to avoid any uh, shortfall that comes and up. And just to be clear, Erwin Jacobs also supports uh, KPBS, yes. so I always like to clarify that. Well, we are out of time, so uh, Gary Robbins of the uh, UT San Diego, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome. A former University of San Diego basketball star has pleaded guilty in a game-fixing case. Brandon Johnson pleaded guilty to bribing a player to influence the outcome of a game. He's one of nine people charged with running a sports betting business. They were accused of fixing West Coast Conference games. The U.S. and Mexico are about to sign a landmark agreement on sharing water from the Colorado River. The deal includes allowing Mexico to store water in Lake Mead, and water agencies in California, Arizona, and Nevada would then buy water from Mexico over three years. The agreement is expected to be signed in San Diego next week. Homeland Security is investigating the Border Patrol's use of force along the border with Mexico. We have an inside look at how agents are trained from Nicole Grether of the Associated Press. Good morning. How are you doing? Good morning, man. Congratulations. Good morning, sir. Congratulations. In New Mexico, they're the latest group of graduates from the Border Patrol Training Academy. My class is comprised of 50 students. And this is where many will likely be working, along the border with Mexico. The border is a, is a tense place. It's, uh, it's very militarized. In the past two years, Border Patrol agents have killed at least 18 people. And in eight of those cases, federal authorities said they were being attacked by people throwing rocks. No matter how big that rock is, there are still ways to avoid being hit by rock. You can't avoid being hit by a bullet. And that's precisely why several members of Congress, including Arizona Representative Raul Grijalva, are calling on the Department of Homeland Security to review the Border Patrol's use of force policies. Rock throwing, I, I think the uh, discretion there, I, I, I think should be the byword. And restraint should be the byword. Beat me down by the railroad track. The Associated Press got an inside look at how candidates are trained to become agents. It's really their first taste of, of Border Patrol life. It's at this 220-acre compound in New Mexico where agents spend nearly two months training. Recruits learn how to process fingerprints. Is it immigration inspection? They board no, buses packed with Hispanic actors and question them on their immigration status. They're also trained on the physical demands of the job. So we're, we're showing them how to effectively arrest somebody, how to take control of a situation, how to handcuff somebody, how to escort a person. And they're taught how and when to use lethal force. 
put them in scenarios where they have to make that judgment, shoot or not, or, or not shoot. But James Cox won't disclose exactly when they're taught to shoot. That's now under review by Homeland Security officials. Meantime, the Justice Department is also investigating multiple allegations of misconduct by agents, including several fatal shootings. This problem is systemic. What can we do to prevent further deaths? And I think, I think that that's where you know the, the, the Customs and Border Protection Agency has not really done a good job. Since 2004, the number of patrol agents has doubled to about 21,500, most deployed to the Mexican border. Nicole Grether, The Associated Press. A retired Marine Corps general from Fallbrook has been sworn in as the new director of California's Parks Department. Major General Anthony Jackson says he'll restore integrity to an agency tainted by the discovery of money hidden in special funds. The money was found as budget cuts threatened to close 70 California parks. Jackson says he will ensure his department handles every nickel and dime honestly. I'm Ray Suarez. On the next news hour, Colorado voters legalize the recreational use of marijuana, plus David Brooks and Ruth Marcus. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. The Humane Society says it's made a $500 million deal to settle an abuse case against a now defunct slaughterhouse in Riverside County. The case led to the biggest meat recall in U.S. history. The settlement is the largest ever made in an animal abuse case. You may recall the video of sick cows being abused by workers who were trying to get them to walk to be slaughtered. Meat from those cows can be contaminated with mad cow and other diseases, although no problems were ever found from this slaughterhouse. Today's settlement is largely symbolic. It won't be paid because the company went out of business. Speaking of business, owners uh, near La Jolla Cove say a foul odor is driving customers away. Peggy Pico finds out why it's worse than ever this year and difficult to solve. Pelican seagulls and other coastal birds have turned the sand-colored bluffs above the La Jolla Cove into a chalky white coated sewer of sorts, complete with a strong stench of bird droppings said to hover over the area up to a mile away. But as my guest voice of San Diego reporter Lisa Halverstadt found out, clearing the air is not really an easy task. It really isn't. <laughs> Lisa, thanks for joining me. Anyone who's been to La Jolla Cove knows that it's easier on the eyes than it is on the nose. Why does the smell seem to be so much worse this year? Well, what's happened is we haven't had a lot of rain, and so the bird poop has been allowed to build. Um, but what's been building for years is that previously this area was fenced off. Now it's not. Now the, the birds and other things can just... Roost. Sea lions. Why was it, uh, you know, we, we see people holding their nose, we're looking at some of the birds, and, and definitely their white uh, leftovers that they leave behind. Why was it fenced off in the first place? Uh, well, it was previously fenced off, or was fenced off because there was some sort of accident that happened. No one seems to remember all the details, but the result was we can't walk around that area anymore. And for your article, you actually talked with several local businesses and some restaurant owners. How many customers? Are they saying they might be losing because of this? Well, they seem to think it's pretty significant. It's very hard to put an exact number on it because it's hard to gauge the number of people that just don't walk in because they decide, I just can't handle this smell. Um, but one restaurant owner thought that maybe he's losing 20 to 30 people a day who just don't even walk in. And in your article, you said people actually say, I, I can't take this, I'm leaving. You've heard people exactly. actually say that. I've actually been sitting in a restaurant and heard a discussion about, can we handle this smell today? Well, uh, before we go any further, let's talk about smell because um, tell us a little backstory. How did you come about this story, especially with your, uh, you have a unique uh, angle on this? Yes, I do. I was drawn to it, but I do not have a sense of smell, which made the reporting process pretty interesting. Um, nearly everyone I talked to kind of chuckled when I told them <laughs> about my disability. Um, but I, I asked them a lot of questions about the smell 
And my boyfriend was actually nice enough to go to the cove with me one day, and I quizzed him for a good 20 minutes about the smell. You borrowed his nose for yes, the story. I did. <laughs> See, are there uh, any health risks associated uh, with this sort of ammonia and, and very strong smell? It's hard to say. Um, the folks that I talked to said that the the degree of the stench and just how much it's permeating the air would have to be pretty high for there to be a direct health risk. But nobody's tested this air. And in fact, the city's had some trouble finding someone to do it. Well, let's talk about this. Then the obvious solution seems very simple. Get a pressure hose out there, wash down the uh, bluffs and, and call it a day. How come that's not happening? Well, there are uh, at least three regulatory agencies who would want to sign off before anything like that were to happen. Um, we also need to note that the California Coastal Commission um, is really watching closely when anything is happening at a, in a coastal area. And especially here, because this is uh, that area is one of 34 very specially protected. Very protected areas. And so even though the poop is considered natural to you and me, um, once it flows into the ocean, it's considered a pollutant. And so permits are required if there's even a chance, even a remote chance, that that uh, feces could end up in the water. Um, how long would it take? You've said three regulatory commissions. How long, any estimates it would take to actually get a permit just to clean it off? Well, it sounds like just an initial permit could take as long as two years, uh, maybe longer even, um, because it wouldn't be considered high priority because we're not talking about a, an extreme amount of pollution here. Um, Sherry Leitner, Councilwoman, she appealed to the governor for state help. Uh, how is that going? How likely is it to succeed? You know, we haven't heard yet. Certainly the governor and Sherry Leitner were quite busy around election season. Um, I know that later on this month there are at least plans to try to vote on uh, some sort of resolution to put more attention on this issue. So we'll see what happens. There's a uh, cleanup petition with 1,200 signatures on it, um, but some La Jolla's actually aren't bothered by it or want to leave it alone? Uh, I would say the majority wants something something done. Um, they're holding their noses every day. But there are some folks who say, hey, this is natural. We knew this when we moved here. This is just nature running its course. All right. Voice of San Diego's Lisa Halverstead, thanks so much for talking with us about this. Thank you this. very much for having me. A ship pulled into the port of San Diego today after six years of conducting scientific research at sea. KPBS reporter Tom Fudge joins us to talk about the Roger Revelle. For those not familiar, what is it? Dwayne, the Roger Revelle is a 270-foot ship, uh, blue and white, that pulled into uh, the dock at Point Loma today, and it's been at sea for six years. It is operated by the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and since it's been at sea for six years, the director of that institution thought it was time for a little shore leave, and so it's back in dock. It's going to get a little bit of maintenance before it goes out again. And, Tom, what has it been doing for the past six years? It's been doing scientific research, a tremendous amount of scientific research. One example I can give you is I talked to an oceanographer who had been on the ship, and he said that he was studying the way atmospheric temperatures and wind affect, affect waves in the ocean. And by learning more about this, you can better know, uh, better predict violent storms like Sandy, which we saw on the eastern seaboard. One thing to keep in mind about uh, operating these ships, Scripps Institution has four of them all together on which they do scientific research. It costs $30 million to operate those ships every year. The way they do it is they partner with lots of other academic institutions that also put their scientists on this ship, and they do research there as well. And this ship was named after Roger Revelle. Remind us who he was. Roger Revelle is really a legendary scientist. He was one of the first directors of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. He was here in San Diego in the 50s and the early 60s. And Roger Revelle is best known for his uh, pioneering groundbreaking uh, research into global climate change and global warming. And so today the ship that is his namesake is plying the ocean waters, doing something that I'm sure was very close to his heart, uh, scientific research. KPBS reporter Tom Fudge. Forecasters have called off El Nino warnings. They had been predicting a wetter than average winter for San Diego because of an El Nino forming in the tropical Pacific, but it stalled. And now they're predicting a more average winter here. Here's a look at our weekend forecast.
And tonight's Public Square, our report on how UT San Diego's poll published just two weeks before the mayoral election may have been skewed to sway public opinion, generated a lively conversation on our website. None of the commenters supported the paper's methods of excluding city workers and cell phone users in the poll, but only a few said they were as surprised as Jen Jen, who wrote, no, seriously, they excluded cell phone users? Estimates from last year from the CDC, which conducts a lot of phone surveys, concluded that at least 22% of adults in San Diego County have ditched landlines and are cellular only. Mission accomplished joked, Manchester takes his cue from Rupert Morlock. What do you expect? While Radio Free took a more scientific approach, he wrote, all the evidence clearly indicates the owner simply uses the UT as a propaganda tool. This distorted political poll is simply the latest example. And the kind gardeners collectively put it this way. In their targeted polling, they also admitted a much larger group, which I belong to, former subscribers. You can join in this conversation or comment on any KPBS story by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, or just email us at publicsquare at kpbs.org. Recapping tonight's top stories, Republican Brian Bilbray has conceded defeat to Democrat Scott Peters in the race for the 52nd Congressional District. The longtime representative says he still plans to fight for issues he believes in. And San Diego City Council President Tony Young is resigning to become CEO of the San Diego chapter of the Red Cross. The city will have to hold a special election to replace him. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend.